for joining us for today's Ipsos webinar, Exploring Affluence Use and Relationship with Media. Today's presentation will be given by Tony Incalcaterra and Jesse Parats, and you can read more about them in the bio slide in front of you. So now without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Tony Incalcaterra, Senior Vice President with Ipsos's Audience Measurement Team. Tony, you have the floor. Thank you, Ellen. It's it's great to be here. I uh, want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, this is uh, actually kind of thrilling for me because I get to co-present with uh, a longtime colleague of mine, Jesse Peretz, uh, who has been working on the affluent study for uh, 16 years now, or over 16 years. Yep. Uh, so today we're we're going to give you some insights on on what we really uh, consider the unique and multifaceted relationship that affluence have with media brands. Uh, you know, it, to be sure, it, it's a very complex relationship that, that continues to evolve really as the media landscape morphs from you know, this history of uh, what I like to refer to as bordered content distribution, you know, where publications were only printed on paper and television programming was only accessible through traditional te uh, television. Uh, now, really, it's a tangled web of cross-platform distribution, 24-7 on-demand availability, and really a blurring of access points. Uh, yet, despite the complexity, uh, affluent engagement with media brands is really strong. Uh, you know, in a nutshell, media still matters, uh, the title of this, this webinar. And, and it's uh, important, particularly in a world where information and misinformation abound. Uh, you know, content distribution really important, imparts a sense of credibility uh, to what is out there. Um, and they're responsible for both the information and the entertainment that uh, runs through their pipes. So I'm gonna turn off my uh, webcam um, because we've got lots of uh, charts to show you and I don't wanna distract from that. Um, in any case, we've got a lot of information to share with you today and, um, and the insights that we're gonna present are really derived from two sources. Um, you know, the first is our ongoing Ipsos Affluent Study USA, which we've been conducting for more than 45 years now. Um, and that's in combination with uh, recontacts that we do on a quarterly basis to respondents of the Affluent Survey, where we get some additional in-depth information from them. Uh, I continue to say we're going to cover a lot of material today, uh, but we're going to start with an exploration of the uh, the passionate embrace that affluents have with, with all things in media. Uh, we're gonna focus next on the importance of television and affluent lives. Uh, and from there, we're gonna talk a little bit about the premature obituary for publications, uh, as we find that they're very much alive and still a very important piece of affluent lives. Jesse's gonna then take us through the explosion in podcasting uh, from a relatively small part of affluent lives to you know, the information and entertainment source um, that more than four in 10 affluents enjoy each month. Uh, he'll continue with some insights about the new soundtrack audio and radio play before commenting on really that complicated relationship that affluents have with social media. Uh, after that, I'll come back and, and discuss a bit more about uh, what affluents really think about media platforms before tying everything up, or hopefully tying everything up in a, in a nice bow to make sense of everything. So let's start with the passion side of things. I mean, affluents by, by their very nature are successful individuals. Uh, and, and really what part of what makes them successful is that they're information seekers. They're inquisitive about the world, about life, and they have a hunger to stay on top of what's happening around them. Uh, you know, as a result, they're, they're truly passionate about connecting with, with the media brands um, that entertain and inform them. You know, and uh, when we look at it, in fact, they're spending more than 46 hours a week interacting with media brands through newspapers, magazines, radio, television, uh, on the web. 
you know, and to put it in perspective, that's more time than they're spending at work, uh, but slightly less time than they're sleeping. So it's a, it's a huge part of their lives. Now, about half of the total media time comes from the various forms of television viewing. Uh, live TV commands the greatest amount of time. Uh, but thanks to the proliferation of streaming service content, that now accounts for almost as much time as live television. Uh, and there are even parts of the day where streaming viewership tops live TV, and we'll show you that in a moment. At five hours a week, social media now is a powerful force to be reckoned with, especially, uh, as you'll see, in the middle of the day. Now, over the last two years, uh, we've, you know, we've been talking a lot about the changes uh, that the pandemic, that COVID brought about. Uh, and this is particularly true in terms of media consumption. More time at home translated into more time with media, quite honestly. Uh, and the biggest increase is really happening with media platforms, particularly online video, streaming services, on-demand TV and podcasts. Now, since they're spending more than six hours a day with media brands, it's, it's really not a surprise to see that they're well connected during waking hours. Uh, affluence are, you know, both during the week, the work week, and then on weekends, there's a great level of connection with, uh, with media throughout the day. Uh, it's especially true in prime time, you know, when, when almost all affluents are exposed to one form of media or another between the hours of 7 and 10 p.m. Now, we don't have information on concurrent usage. You know, we don't know for sure how many people are reading while they're watching TV or posting on social media while they're listening to a podcast. But we can tell you that during specific time periods, affluents are engaging with multiple forms of media. It peaks at 3.36 uh, different forms of media between 5 and 7 p.m. And, and that uh, spans both commuting time, dinner time, the shift prime time. Uh, but during prime time, you know, between 7 and 10 p.m., we start to see fewer different platforms being used, um, which really could result in the, in the shift from information gathering uh, during the day to entertainment, uh, you know, as, as people begin to sort of wind down from the day. Uh, you know, it's really particularly true as we see more people watching streaming services and live TV during that time period. Now, during the day, um, there really aren't any clear winners, if you will. You know, affluents are consuming across the media landscape. What you're seeing now is, you know, what I commonly or what I often call the, the spaghetti uh, chart because there's just a lot of things that are happening. Um, we can see that live TV and streaming services are, are most dominant in the evening. Um, but even there, there are so many other things that are happening during that time frame. You know, as affluents continue to read, to listen, uh, and, and to watch other forms of media. Uh, but one of the things that I find most interesting is that is how consistently affluents use social media across the day. Um, it, it's really quite interesting. I mean, from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m., more affluents are engaged with social media than any other medium. And, and it's essentially tied with uh, satellite radio between 2 and 5 p.m. Dinner time, they hold their own against live TV, um, but it's during prime time where they, although they maintain a fairly strong presence, it's, it's just nothing compared to television, live TV and streaming services. And when we look at the weekend, there's really little drop off in how affluents are consuming media. Uh, but it looks like we might be sleeping a little later uh, than we are during the work week, so we get a later start. Um, and quite honestly, if we look at social media again, um, it's the dominant player from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. You know, as we're reporting on the things that are happening in our lives or uh, checking on friends and family on social media. 
Now, while we often see differences between men and women, the engagement with media is relatively consistent across the day. Um, there are clear differences, you know, don't, no doubt, in the media brands they're connecting with. Um, and if you'd like more information about that, you know, please feel free to reach out to Jesse or to me and we can help uh, understand a little bit more about that. Now, morning time is certainly not my friend. I am not a morning person. Um, anyone who knows me knows that. Um, but it doesn't really seem to be a friend to a lot of people. There's certainly a lower incidence amongst the younger generations in how they're using media. Uh, prime time is, is sort of the great equalizer. Pretty much everyone is consuming. Uh, and by the time we get to late night, it's really the younger generations that are consuming more than their older counterparts. So there are some differences in the connectivity during the course of the day. As I mentioned earlier, about half of the time affluent spend with media comes from the various types of television viewing. Uh, from Monday to Friday, live TV and streaming services really dominate the evening hours. But it's really important to note that watching online video holds court earlier in the day uh, and really even manages to increase during prime time when, uh, quite honestly, the, the streaming services perform best. So between 10 p.m. and midnight, there are almost as many affluents who are watching online video as watching live TV or streaming services. And, you know, and this is part of that wind down period. Uh, online videos have, you know, replaced uh, bedtime reading in, in many ways as, as uh, people wind down from the day. Uh, on demand TV and DVR playback, you know, are clearly primetime activities that, that really don't happen uh, at other points in the day. Now, while the relative positions hold on the weekends, uh, we do see that the levels of engagement tend to, to drop slightly uh, compared to the Monday to Friday levels. Now, during COVID, during the pandemic, we did see a large increase in viewing streaming services, which really was uh, likely a combination of a couple of factors. Uh, the fact that there were production halts and delays for many live TV programs, uh, coupled, you know, really with the dearth of live sports. Um, but as much of live TV uh, returned to normal and we started to see uh, new content, uh, we really were seeing the streaming services holding steady during the evening hours, which to us was uh, essentially saying that this is a fairly permanent shift um, that, you know, this is not just because um, the uh, production um, delays or, the, or what we were seeing back then, uh, but you know, really it's the result of more people re returning to their normal habits and their habits have changed slightly. You know, when we look at um, fact that people, more people are returning to commuting and returning to an office environment, we do see a drop off in streaming service usage late at night and during the day. Um, so we're, we're disconnecting, if you will, a little earlier as the demands of, you know, our return to work life as we, as we knew it uh, continue to build. Now, uh, they don't call it prime time for no reason. Um, the vast majority of affluents are engaging, engaging excuse me, with one or more genres of live television programs uh, between the hours of 7 and 10 p.m. And when I say live, I don't literally mean live um, programming, but just live TV. You know, so what are they seeking out during that time? Well, overall, drama is the big draw for affluence, uh, with comedy coming in a pretty close second. Uh, but the difference is that the younger generations are much more likely to be seeking a good laugh. You know, for them, comedy is the clear winner over drama. And not surprisingly, men are almost three times as likely as women 
say they're watching sports programming during prime time, and they're far more likely to be watching action and adventure. On the other hand, women favor reality TV much more so than men, uh, as well as family-friendly cooking and food programs. Now, one of the things I, I uh, like to relay is that, you know, upon hearing that this major American newspaper printed his obituary, uh, Mark Twain quipped that the, you know, quote, reports of my death are greatly exaggerated, end quote. And I think this is really applicable to the publication industry where, you know, we've just heard rumors of the death of print um, and it's just circulated for many years. Uh, but the reality is that many publication brands have re reinvented themselves and evolved far beyond being just a medium that's printed on paper. So even during the pandemic, many of the typical points of contacts uh, that were closed to publications like doctor's office, doctor's waiting rooms, uh, salons, you know, other public places, um, those were temporarily unavailable to them. Uh, but these publication brands found other ways to disseminate their content to really what, what amounted to loyal readers. So we know that overall readership of printed on paper publications declined during COVID. What we did see, however, was that the pattern of readership throughout the day remained fairly consistent, uh, that there is a, uh, a peak on both the beginning of the day and then prime time for printed uh, publications. But we should also point out that even though TV is king during prime time, we still see a fairly healthy level of publication reading occurring during that time. And, and we're gonna talk a little bit more um, about concurrent usage uh, and just what is happening uh, later on in the presentation. Now, as I mentioned, um, loyal readers found alternatives in order to stay engaged with their favorite publication brands during the pandemic. You know, as things got worse, printed on paper, um, readership declined. Uh, but what we did see was a substantial increase in affluence who were reading the digital issues of publications. So when they couldn't engage uh, in the more traditional way, they found other ways to get the same type of connection with these brands. You know, and in the, in the increasing world of social media, uh, we find that almost four in 10 affluents follow their favorite publication brand through posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and other platforms. So in a nutshell, uh, publishers have really found new life for their brands uh, and affluents are following them. In addition to, you know, to all of those things and seeking out the digital issues or the social media posts, Affluence really have found new ways to engage with those favorite publication brands. Uh, so what we found is in the past month, uh, one in five Affluence have listened to a podcast that was specifically created by a publication brand. And that's really helping those brands to extend beyond printed issues. It's quickly becoming a major point of content consumption for, uh, for Affluence. Um, so my colleague Jesse is now going to take you through some of our findings on the subject of podcasting. Thanks, Tony. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. Um, so when we're looking at podcasting, this is for tracking from our Affluent survey from the past few uh, five years. And you can see that the data has kind of, it was growing from 2016 through 2019, but it really started to take off a little bit more in 2020 and 2021 during the pandemic. Um, and, the, and the pandemic really accelerated it. And you can see um, from this data that there's always a little, there's been a slightly more male skew to it. Um, next slide. Um, Podcasts are one of the fastest growing types of media. Um, and you can see that 
this is from our tracking the barometer the women have really been driving the um, the growth um, there's a 16 point increase from 2019 to 2021 among women um, and the Gen Z and millenn and the younger affluence um, have increased a great deal as well. That's also what's driving it is a, you know, there's a 12 point increase there. Uh, what we don't wanna overlook though, is that the Gen X and boomers have also grown a great deal. Uh, affluent boomers have grown almost 50% in the, of the podcast um, in listening. So they're, you know, they're not the drivers of it, but they're a significant amount of the audience and they are, you know, they shouldn't be overlooked in that. Um, next slide. Um, so podcast listening throughout the day, it's a little wonky. There's been growth from 2019, especially in the morning commute, there was a growth from 2019 to 2020 and to 2021 that kind of stayed consistent. So we expect that to be there. Uh, what we find most interesting here is that there seems to be like a little bit of a lunch push with podcasts. Um, we don't really have any reason to, any way to explain what's happening with that other than it's generally a medium that you have to focus on when listening to it. So it's something that you may want to um, do while eating your lunch or something. Um, there is a drop off at night, but it, it stays pretty consistent. It's not really the commute focus that radio is. Um, next slide. Um, so podcast listeners are extremely loyal um, with two thirds listening to almost every episode or most episodes. Um, only about a quarter listen to kind of episodes here or there. This is kind of a um, part of what the medium is, where a lot of the a lot of podcasts are um, timely, and you have to listen to them kind of often. Um, if you can move on to the next slide, and when you listen, and when people are listening to them, they listen to them all the way through. Ninety-one percent listen to most or all of an episode when they listen to it. Yeah, there's some people who skip the end credits and you know but it, nobody's listening to bits and pieces of it in ways they're really listening to the full podcast to the extent that there's information being given to them um next again these are timely things so people listen to them when they come out um yeah you know, we have about 85 75% of podcasts are listened to within the first week of being released um and then there's some slight difference between men and women women are less likely to be listening to them within the first week but we'll get into why in a second um and you can see oh, sorry can you go back um and the and also with the generations, you can see that the you know, the older generations are less likely to be listening to the timelier podcast, but they're still mostly listening to them within a week of their release. Um, now you can go to the next slide. Um, why are people listening to the podcast? Well, it, there's three things that people really are going for. They're looking for entertainment, they're looking for knowledge, and they're looking to stay informed. Um, yeah, you know, it's not really a relaxing activity. It's not something that you're doing as a, you know, main focus of what you're doing. Um, so it's really just a, you want to know what's happening in the world or you're looking for an escape with the entertainment. Um, uh, if you can go to the next slide. Here you see what kind of podcasts people are listening to and you know, entertainment, comedy, news, politics, business, and finance. The entertainment could be more time focused with some of the 
you know, maybe more cultural podcasts and things where people are kind of recapping shows or that you've watched or recap or talking about celebrity gossip. Um, and comedy is obviously escapism for people, but news podcast politics and business and finance are going to be things that you have to listen to, you know, when they come out, otherwise you've lost the uh, thread on them. Um, women are more likely to listen to the entertainment podcasts than men. Men listen to sports podcasts, which doesn't come up for women in their top podcasts. Um, one thing that we found interesting when looking at this was um, we did ask about like parenting podcasts and while parents did listen to them more than non-parents, they came, they were still like the seventh or eighth ranked for the parents because they, they're not listening to those as much as they want to listen to things to not think about their kids. Um, next slide. So we asked people what podcasts they listen to. We got a lot of responses. Um, most of these will pop up in the top podcasts that you list that you see. Uh, the Daily, Joe Rogan Experience, Planet Money, This American Life. Um, all hugely popular podcasts. There's also some you know, Conan O'Brien and some sports podcasts mixed in there, but it really runs the gamut and it's you know, what people are interested in that they're listening to. Um, when we look at the pod, when we ask them what apps they use, obviously people using Apple devices are gonna use Apple podcasts. And then for the people who aren't on Apple devices, you're getting Spotify and Google as the main um, apps they're listening on. Um, you want to go to the next slide? Um, as I said, podcast is something that people do while doing something else. So, you know, a lot of people are doing it while commuting, which is expected, but you know, not the main thing that they're doing when they're listening to the podcast. Um, household chores, it's kind of something to do while you're doing something else while they're working. Where we saw the biggest differences in gender were the you know men listen to podcasts while they're working out and running, and women listen to podcasts when they're you know getting ready to go out and do stuff more than men do. Um, but th these are you know these are activities that you'd expect people to be doing to be listening to something anyway and what's happened is that they've shifted to listening to podcasts versus listening to music. Um, if you want to go on to the next slide. Uh, one other thing that's happening in media right now is we're seeing a lot of things like Patreons and Substacks and creator-driven content pop up. This is something where we're seeing you know, some penetration into the affluent market with five people subscribing to them, but it's still very small and these are very much in their infancy. Um, so it's one of those things that you see in media circles and talking about and worrying about, um, but there, there's just not a reach for the um, for these yet, but it's going to happen soon. And you know, these are similar to podcasts and people listen, people will subscribe to things they're interested in more so than anything else. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, Tony, the getting back into audio. Um, so this is what audio listening looks like throughout the day on one of our favorite spaghetti charts. Um, you see that there's a big increase from six to nine for the commuters. And then, you know, throughout the day kind of tails off and there's a little bit more at the five to seven for an evening commute. Um, what you're seeing here though is at between noon and two during like lunchtime, the podcasts and the streaming audio both have that bump into the doing something else while eating lunch where you know 
traditional radio and satellite radio were both dipping during that time. Um, if you want to move on. Um, so this shows us the growth, or this shows us what has happened with um, AM FM re radio during the uh, pandemic. You can see, you know, in from that 6 to 9 a.m., that morning commute, that really tailed off in 2020 when people weren't commuting as much anymore because of COVID, but they were listening to things. The interesting thing is that I found, though, was that 9 to 12 block, the people who would have gotten out of their car and gone into their office now just left their radio on, and they seem to have enjoyed that, like, secondary, that, that morning, uh, whatever follows their morning sh commute show. Um, so they're, they're sticking with that and it's still growing, which we do find interesting. Um, and there's growth in, there's places where it dipped and now it's bouncing back for the rest of the day, but that it, it's, there's no reason to believe those won't come back down a little bit once commutes change again. Um, if you want to move on to the next one, Tony, um, this is satellite radio in the same way. It, it we're kind of seeing the same thing with that, you know, six to nine and then nine to 12, but we're not seeing quite the same, um, grasp on that nine to 12, um, uh, power, uh, but everywhere else it's basically bounced back, uh, to levels of pre-pandemic. Um, uh, next slide. Um, streaming radio has just grown a little bit during the pandemic, not a great deal, um, but it's still there. This is, yeah, this is what we ask people with Pandora and Spotify and things like that, where they're streaming their music. So it, it's, there's some growth showing and they've bounced back from pre-pandemic levels. We're not quite sure where that's going to go from here. Um, if you can go to the next one. Um, and this is what people are listening to in the radio formats for among affluence. It's um, from the affluent survey. So classic rock and rock are the top choices and then news and talk country classic. Um, next slide. All right, so social media, we see social media kind of steady throughout the day. Um, it looks different from other media in this. It, it's growing. It, it's once you wake up, you go on and then, you know, some more people are added on throughout the day, each day. Um, nothing else really behaves like this. Most media kind of dips after 9 a.m. and then comes back up for the 5 to 7 or 7 to 10 um hours um, next slide so we asked people in the affluent survey what they do on social media um most people say they like things their friends have posted they send messages they post pictures um they like brands or products um and that's one that we want to focus on. So if we can go to the next one, what's it mean when people say they like brands or products? We have a follow-up question and we ask them. Yeah, what we found interesting here is for the younger affluence, this is much more aspirational when they like something on social media, um, when they like a brand or a product on social media. They're, they're less likely to already own the item than Gen X or boomers and seniors. Um, but it is something that they want to buy or use soon at a greater level. Um, what I found a little interesting here was that you know, there's not a lot of penetration in the get deals and discounts, and that's actually higher among the boomers and seniors than among the Gen Z and millennials who are looking at these more aspirationally. Um, next slide. And with social media, it's really an important part 
of Gen Z and millennials lives. Um, they've grown up with it. I know that as a geriatric millennial, I've had social media since uh, basically I graduated from college. But that means everybody else that's younger than me has had it since they've been in college or have been in high school or younger. Um, yeah, you, you see big divides in the Gen Z and millennials and the boomers and seniors, especially in the things like I would be lost without social media and my online identity is an important part of who I am. It, it's just not important to boomers and seniors because it's never been important to boomers and seniors because they never had it until you know they were already established in their lives. What I did find, what we do find really interesting is that the things where the boomers and seniors really creep up on the Gen Z millennials and Gen Xers are the I have unfriended or blocked people on social media because of their posts and the you know, the, who we like to call lurkers of, I, I check social media to see what others are up to, but I don't post much myself. Um, these aren't really surprising. They're, um, we are a little bit surprised to see that the, that people are unfriending and blocking people as much as they say they are, but it's, you know, um, with the political environment, that's not all that surprising. Um, yeah, Gen Z and millennials really use this as their way to interact with their friends. Yeah, that, that's the last bar chart with, I'm always checking on my family and friends through Facebook and other social networking websites in a way that you know, the Gen X, and same, similar to Gen X, but the boomers and seniors aren't. And this is partially because you know, the Gen Xers are also having kids during the time that they're that social media was coming of age and they're used to it and that's how they share their kids pictures. That's how they um, interact with other parents as well. Um, you, and then I will send it back to you, Tony, to discuss the perceptions. All right, well, thank you, Jesse. And, and thanks for introducing me to the new term geriatric millennial. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to remember that. Um, so anyway, we've, we've given you a, a lot of information about usage and, and what we wanted to focus on in the, in the next few minutes is um, affluent feelings about media, how, you know, what they mean to them. And uh, you know, we've seen lots of anecdotal evidence that uh, that talks about the erosion and trust of media brands, you know, and that's really particularly important in in this environment of you know hypersensitivity, whether it's politics or uh, or security breaches of user information, uh, information scandals, those kinds of things. So uh, to really get a better understanding of this, we asked uh, respondents to rate media types on three factors, on trustworthiness, superficiality, and influence. So we asked them to, uh, to uh, using an eight-point scale, where zero means that the media type is unreliable, uh, and seven uh, means that they're trustworthy. Uh, we asked them to rate nine media types, live television, streaming services, online videos, AM, FM radio, satellite radio, podcasts, uh, magazines, newspapers, and social media. And, and most of the media type ratings are, are clustered mid-range. Uh, uh, in this instance, uh, in terms of trustworthiness, uh, what we're seeing um, is that streaming services and newspapers are really in a statistical tie for being most or highest rated as far as trustworthiness. Social media and online video uh, are considered to be the least reliable um, of, the, of the group. Uh, but we should note that you know, some advertising on all of these media uh, platforms could be impacted by the, you know, these positive or negative perceptions uh, that affluents have about the reliability 
uh, or trustworthy nature of the platforms. Uh, when we look at superficiality, um, we find that newspapers, not surprisingly, rise to the top of in-depth coverage. This is what newspapers are known for. Uh, but it's followed um, closely by one of the newer media platforms, which is podcasting. You know, as Jesse described, um, the relationship that uh, that affluents have with podcasts, particularly in terms of information seeking or uh, in terms of the amount of uh, the podcasts that the um, that affluents listen to, um, really sort of gives us a good indication that this is a natural extension for newspapers, and not surprisingly, you know, a lot of the newspapers really have. Um, some of the biggest podcasts uh, like the New York Times. Um, now again, social media on this scale is perceived on the lower end of the scale uh, and it's you know it's considered more superficial than in-depth. Um, despite the low ratings of trustworthiness and in-depth coverage though, social media rises to the number one spot when it comes to affluent perceptions of being most influential. And this is this dichotomy is, is, is really hard to explain because we don't know if this is a reflection of their personal experience, meaning that they, they uh, find themselves influenced by what they're um, what they're reading on social media or what their friends or family are posting, or whether this is a reflection of um, their perceptions that social media has had a, a you know, significant impact on politics and other areas of life um, you know, where social media is, is really seen as having a heavy influence on others, not necessarily on themselves. So as we look at um, how affluents perceive themselves, we, we see that um, Three in ten affluents consider themselves news junkies, and you know they're always looking to stay current uh, and to understand more about the world around them. Um, we also see that you know many affluents have migrated to other forms of newspaper content, uh, but we still have 37% who are saying they still enjoy reading on on paper. Um, you know, not surprisingly, when, when we look at those results in more detail. Uh, the older generations are, are more than twice as likely to say it, uh, that they enjoy reading it on paper as the younger generations. Uh, and of course, you know, the opposite is, is true when it comes to finding out about news events through social media. It's really driven specifically by the youngest affluence. Okay, so we've, we've talked about uh, the importance of the dominance of television, um, but really there's some warning signs out there for the medium. Uh, there seems to be you know, uh, a lack of satisfaction, uh, a lack of what we used to call appointment television. So when we talk to affluents, four in 10 of them are saying that they regularly flip through the TV channels at night um, you know, signaling a really a wanderlust, if you will, trying to find something that they want to watch. Uh, more than one in three say that they can't find anything to watch, so they settle for something rather than find something that fits their needs or desires. Um, and particularly worrisome for TV is the fact that more than half of all affluents say that they have the TV on in the background but that their attention is focused on other things. So, you know, if TV is going to continue uh, its dominant role in, in the media landscape, it's really going to need to address the, the disconnect on content um, because it can't, um, it can't continue to be in the background and continue um, to deliver audiences for marketers uh, in a way that's going to make a, a true connection. Finally, you know, let's come back and talk to the new kid, you know, about the new kid on the block with, you know, podcasts. You know, they, they really do seem to be hitting the right note with affluent listeners. 
So almost half of them feel, you know, a tight connection to podcasts. Um, they say that you know, they are part of a community when they listen to them. So it, you know, it's the sense of belonging that that pulls people together in these podcast communities, and that was really true, particularly true during the pandemic, uh, when we you know we saw that affluents were feeling a loss of personal connections. They were feeling uh, an alienation uh, in many ways, and this was a way for them to engage uh, beyond. Uh, the personal face-to-face -face side of things. Uh, so podcasts go, you know, beyond simple entertainment. Uh, you know, we see the overwhelming majority of podcast, of affluent podcast listeners saying that they appreciate podcasts for the fact that uh, they make them think, you know, think about the world around them, think about themselves. Uh, you know, of course, that's not to say that that entertainment isn't a strong factor, it is. Uh, it can do both. Uh, a slight majority of, of listeners say that they, you know, they want to escape from reality. Um, again, I don't see these two things in uh, in conflict. Uh, I think you can think and you can escape at the same time. But the point really being that podcasts um, are pulling affluence in and engaging them to a, you know, to a great degree. So, you know, as, as we often do in, in these um, webinars, we've got so much information that we want to share with you guys, uh, and we've covered a lot of ground today. But uh, before we end, uh, you know, let me just uh, recount some of what I think are the most important elements <clears throat> and key, uh, key takeaways uh, for everyone. So the first really is that, you know, television is still the dominant media force, you know, through it's many forms, you know, live TV, streaming, on demand, et cetera. It's the device, uh, really, you know, and I emphasize the word device uh, through what uh, or through which affluence are staying informed and entertained. Uh, but there are some warning signs for television that, that need to be addressed, you know, especially when it comes to advertising supported television. You know, we have streaming services, you know, most of which are advertising free, but some of which are ad supported. Um, they're gaining traction. There's lots more of them. Um, and it's making it more difficult for, uh, for marketers to capture the attention of their target prospects uh, because it is um, disseminated across so many different places, disaggregated. Uh, you know, in an area here where, where programming content is really critical, uh, as we just mentioned, we're seeing a disconnect in interest, which needs to be addressed. Uh, otherwise, we're going to continue to see television while it's still playing an important uh, or an important part of affluent media. Um, if it is not engaging to the degree that it used to, uh, it will suffer, uh, quite honestly. Now, new media options, the, the second thing we really want to point out, um, they're extending you know, the opportunity for really traditional media to distribute their content in, in lots of different ways. Um, you know, we're truly in this era where the, what I used to refer to as the borders of media um, you know, the, the fact that uh, all media brands are now cross-platform. They've got multiple ways uh, to connect and communicate with their loyal followers. Uh, and that's providing lots of opportunity for marketers because it's, um, it's a way for people to connect with prospects in meaningful ways that go beyond just a single approach. So um, a marketer, can connect with a uh, a brand loyalist through you know uh, entertainment through you know paper through um, social media on and on. Uh, it allows them to really touch that person or that prospect in many different ways, um, and that allows them to get different messages across it in different um, in different approaches. 
Now, lastly, uh, you know, we really need to continue to watch how the younger generations are, are moving on to the next thing. You know, without a doubt, uh, we see peer-to-peer -peer social media playing a significant force in young lives. Uh, you know, in some ways, it's it's all consuming. You know, these youngsters um, see this as a source that keeps them informed, entertained, uh, in touch with their friends. You know, traditional media, I think, are going to continue to play an important part in the lives of affluence, certainly for the near term. Uh, and, and hopefully for a lot longer, uh, you know, but quite honestly, unless there's a change uh, in how young affluents approach media as they get older, uh, the media future is going to solidly be in the realm of social media. So in any case, I, you know, I hope that you've learned a lot from today's webinar. Um, I think we've got time for a couple of questions. Um, but if we can't get to your questions, you know, please feel free to reach out to us if you'd like some additional information. So I do see that we have a question, Jesse. Maybe you can uh, can take this. Uh, uh, you mentioned that TV is still king, um, but that social media is strong amongst the younger generations. Uh, are the younger generations ignoring television altogether? Um, the short answer to that is no. They're they're not watching traditional TV at the same levels as older generations are, but they're watching shows on streaming and through you know other and through things like YouTube and stuff. They're just not watching traditional TV at the same rate right now. Um, but it's still they're still watching television. They're just not watching what you know we like to think as of as television. Cool. All right, and then uh, someone is asking Jesse if Spotify falls, yeah, where it falls in the audio categories, um, and I think it it falls in our streaming radio or streaming, uh, yeah, streaming radio. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And then we've got another question. Ah, uh, I love this question. It says, uh, uh, "Ah, he just answered my question. Never mind. That that's that's the easiest uh, question ever." Um, <laughs> okay, one. Uh, we see one more question. Given all of the declines, what do you think the future holds for printed publications? I I can take that one. Um, you know, I. I this is a difficult thing um, in that we're going to we're likely going to see you know continued declines in print readership, certainly based on the aging population. But I think um, that the brands have done a very good job of extending beyond the traditional, uh, approaches to getting information out there. And it's really going to depend on um, how successful they are with continuing um, to make a, you know, a connection with people. Uh, for the younger generations, you know, as, as we talked about, social media is going to be important. I think most publication brands have, um, have really done a very good job of you know pushing their social media platforms um, and that could be one way that they continue to reinvent themselves and um, and to find you know new life uh, as uh, as time goes on um okay so i think we're run out of time um and i really just you know again just want to thank everybody for joining us today uh, have a great rest of your day and uh, please reach out to us if you'd like some additional information. So thank you very much. Thank you.